Hello, this is Mike Omega again from Whiskey Gulch, New Hampshire, breeder of large fowl New Hampshire's, and also moderator of the New Hampshire's SOP group on Facebook. I posted a couple of videos earlier of how I hatch and brood my chicks, and I want to talk a little bit today in this video about probably one of the most important aspects of breeding birds and that is growing out our chicks that we hatch. So I'm actually standing on the roof of my house because it gives us a good overview of my of my facilities that I use for growing out my birds. I just wanted to show you this overview because uh, it covers a couple of different things. <clears throat> Over here we have my individual grow out pins. I also use those as breeder pins for my breeder birds. I have 20 of these units and we'll go over them in some detail here after I climb down, hopefully without breaking my neck. Then I have four A-frame units that we're going to go over here shortly that are out on the pasture where I uh, grow out the birds until I cull them in the uh, late summer, early fall. So let's uh, head down and take a look at what I've got. Just take a couple of minutes and comment on what I think is the biggest oversight that people getting uh, excited and starting to breed poultry overlook. And that is the amount of facilities and feed and other expenses you need for the birds when they're growing out. You know, it's really easy to buy, a, say, a GQF cabinet incubator and get six dozen hatching eggs from a breeder. Um, you hatch those chicks out. You need a small room to take care of them in, a small space. But where the rubber really hits the road with these birds is when we have to grow these chicks that we hatched out. Because that is when you need to have a lot of facilities and the resources to provide these birds with what they need. And that is basically facilities and feed and most importantly, I think the thing that mo many people forget about is space. If you grow birds in cramped conditions, you are not going to reach the genetic potential that, that these birds have. And that's what being a breeder is all about. It is in having birds that have the maximum breeding and genetics, but then you need to allow those genetics to express themselves well, and that requires feed and facilities. If you don't have feed and facilities, you can have the best genetics in the world, and you're never gonna realize the maximum potential that your birds have, their genetic potential, because the birds are growing up cramped, they're stressed, they're picking on each other, um, they're crowded, and they just aren't going to reach genetic, their genetic potential. So you need to have a lot of space for growing out birds to run around. Um, you can see I do have quite a few birds in this pen, but this pen is uh, 50 foot square. And so I have 2,500 square feet available to these birds. And then I have a shelter there that's 10 foot by 12 foot. That allows me to have plenty of space for the birds to sleep in but during the day they're out on this pasture running around if you don't have space and you don't have uh, feed as I mentioned you aren't gonna have good birds uh, no matter how good the breeding goes into things and I'm gonna go out on a limb here and probably get some comments that disagree but I think that I've seen many times where people don't have necessarily the best genetics for their birds, the best breeding going into their birds, as far as the genetics are concerned, but they have really good facilities. They have, um, they have the space, and they have the housing, and they have the feed, and those people are doing well at shows because they have great condition on their birds, and their birds, even though they may have genetics that aren't as good as, as birds, that as other birds that are out there, the, what they've done is they've allowed their genetics to reach their maximum potential and um, that's why they're doing well. 
So um, anyhow, there's some controversy for you. But I think the basics to remember are you need to really think seriously if you're going to breed. Um, like the number of birds that I have here, I have um, about 100 birds on the ground between these um, four different areas. But um, each group of birds has a, a very large amount of space. And um, I think that that's just something I'd like to remind people of when you're hatching out birds. Um, I'm really fortunate in that I live on, a, on my uh, farm and I have a lot of space um, to utilize. If you have just a small, um, a small place, have a small breeding program. There's nothing wrong with that. If, if uh, I lived in town and had a very limited amount of space, I would rather have uh, less birds on the ground to grow out but be able to let them reach their maximum genetic potential than to just hatch a whole lot of birds in, in hopes I'm going to win the lottery and, uh, and, you know, that next dozen eggs that I hatch could be the show winner for this year. How many times have, have we thought that as breeders? I'd rather not think that way, and I'd rather hatch just, say, one or two dozen chicks in a very limited, uh, if I was in a very limited space situation, and grow them out really well with good facilities for the space I have and get it done right. I think you're more likely to see the good birds then. Because if you raise birds under cramped conditions, what you're going to select for when you look at your birds and you cull is you're going to select for birds that don't necessarily have the best genetics for the breed, but you're going to select birds that have the best genetics for growing up under stressed conditions, under cramped conditions um, where it's not ideal. And that's not what we want. At least that's not what I want. And um, think about that the next time you're thinking about how many eggs to hatch or how many breeds to raise. For me, I just raised New Hampshire's because I want to do really well with, uh, with my birds, with my New Hampshire's, and I want to hatch a lot of them, and I want to provide them with the space they need, and I don't want to hatch any other breeds because each breed you do requires just that much more space and facilities. So I, for me, I put everything that I have into my uh, New Hampshire's, and then I uh... so here we are now in my uh, grow out pasture I have a uh, four of these a-frame a type um, shelters that we use and we subdivide our pasture into four different areas separating males from uh, males from females and then separating age groups from each other uh, the birds do really well in this system. It works for me. Um, I don't know if it worked for everybody, but I'll tell you a little bit about it here. Um, one of the most important things for people that are growing out poultry is to have a good fence. Those fences do two things. Number one, they keep predators out. And I can't tell you how many times I've read on websites or on groups where people say, a coyote came and got my chickens. I find that really upsetting, not because the coyote got the chickens necessarily, but because the owner of the flock let the coyote be able to get at their chickens. If a predator's coming and getting your birds, in my opinion, it's your own damn fault. It's our responsibility as poultry keepers to keep predators and our birds separate from each other and so how I do that here is I have a, a black cyclone fence it's a perimeter fence for our, our entire pasture here runs along the outside and I have electrified wire on the bottom and top of that fence electric fence is really effective at keeping predators at bay they won't mess with it here in our area, we have coyotes, of course. They're everywhere. Uh, raccoons, those are everywhere, of course. But in addition to those standard predators, we also have black bear that come down and eat fruit out of our orchards in the fall. And there's a lot of them in the area. And we also have cougars. There's quite a few of those in the area. 
we uh, are able to keep all those at bay with uh, good electric fencing. So we have a perimeter fence that has a top and bottom wire on it. That keeps climbing critters from coming up over the fence and it also keeps predators that might be patrolling along the fence looking for um, a hole or looking for a way to get in. They touch that bottom wire and they get a heck of a shock. And I put a high power charger on it. You want to have a charger that is designed for long spans of fence and it has a lot of energy which is measured in joules. And so you want to have at least one um, 1 1.5 joules in your fence. A lot of the fences that are sold at the local feed stores and whatnot, they have about 0.5 joules in their fence. The fence that I have here um, powers, uh, powers uh, the chicken fence as well as my pasture fencing for my cattle. And I believe it's a 2.5 joule unit. So don't skimp on your charger, and you're going to spend some money on it. But fencing and and um, is our first way that we keep predators out. And the other thing that it does is it keeps the birds in. What we have here, what I use is I really like this semi-permanent netting that's available. I have the power off, otherwise I get a hell of a shock. This semi-permanent poultry netting that's available from premier uh, supplies I think it's premier one supplies.com um, I like to get the semi-permanent netting it has a thicker post on it so it's it's sturdier has a better uh, two-prong base and the distance between the posts is closer together the reason I like that is I don't like my netting to sag in the center um, I believe this is 42 inch high netting um, which is just believe it or not the birds really don't fly much in between in between corrals or pastures rather the only time that happens is if you have sexually mature males next to sexually mature hens and then you get some flyover from the males usually and um, but I really don't find it a problem for growing out birds I think it's really great <coughs> The other thing we do is you want to have good corner posts and this is a fiberglass resin post. They're available from a, quite a few different companies. The one I get it for, the one I get this system from, uh, the white one you see here is from Powerflex Fencing. And the reason that I like this post is it's completely insulated. It doesn't con the fence doesn't lose any energy through the post. Now wooden posts can work as long as they're completely dry, but as soon as that post if it's wood gets any moisture on it it becomes conductive and you lose energy out of your fence so don't don't skip on your don't skimp on your fencing the other thing you want to do is you want to manage your pasture not like a weed patch but you want to treat it like a pasture and our job is to plant plants that chickens like to eat and we'll look at a couple of them here that we have I have a um, really good sod for my growing region planted in here um, this is happens to be a perennial ryegrass which for my area grows really super well there's my house over there and my chicken house this perennial ryegrass um, forms um, it's a mix of perennial rye and creeping red fescue and that gives me a really good sod you want to talk with um, your local extension or with somebody that's an expert and don't go down to Home Depot thinking that you're going to get an expert in lawn care there. You might luck out, but talk to somebody that knows, especially your Master Gardeners program that your county extension may have. You want to plant, plant you want to have a really good sod established and you want to move these houses so that they don't, and move your feeders so that the birds don't uh, destroy your sod. <laughs> by staying in one spot so the plants what I've done here is I interplanted my my sod with a clover and this happens to be a micro clover um, clovers do really well being cut short and the birds like to eat them and they're they're high in nitrogen which is good for the birds to be able to build protein the other plant that's here um, it's kind of hard to see here pull out this is broadleaf plantain. 
um, it's a low growing plant and it provides excellent forage. You can see this, this here is your broadleaf plantain mixed together with your clover. Um, I, what I do is I just overseed in the winter and uh, I get a really nice stand of, of clover every year and it just keeps coming back of course. And um, so we want the pasture to provide some nutrition to the birds. But of course, pasture doesn't provide all of your nutrition. You need to have supplemental feed available at all times. It just kills me when I see folks that say, oh, my birds do just fine on pasture 100%. Um, these birds need high levels of protein to perform well, and they may live if just on pasture, but chickens are omnivores, they're predators, and they need to have a good, a good amount of protein. You simply aren't going to grow enough protein um, on open sod in the forms of worms or insects because the birds are going to eat all those things out in the first day or first couple of days and then they're going to be low on protein. So you always have to be providing a really good feed to your birds at all times even if they're on pasture. Another thing that I do is I provide feed to my birds um, all the time it's available to growing birds. I really kind of uh, is hard for me when I hear people say, I'm growing out my chickens, how many times per day should I feed them? Well, you shouldn't ever have them go without feed. They should always have feed in front of them. So that's a little bit about my, um, my pasture management. Let's maybe talk about one of these uh, buildings here. So here we are looking at <clears throat> one of my buildings these uh, this is a cockerel grow out pin uh, these birds were hatched um, in the middle part of February so they're uh, they're now a few months old and um, I have them sheltered in these a-frame shelters and I really like these shelters uh, the plans that I got for these shelters were originally designed by Harvey anyway um, I got the plans from him and we've done of course because I like to tinker with things we've done a number of modifications on these units I'll probably post another video and I have a bunch of pictures of us constructing these so I might put that together in a separate video to actually talk about the dimensions and how we put these together and whatnot but let's talk about them in in general here so the first thing is I like to have metal roofing. I think that metal roofing is really great. It lasts a long time, and it also provides structure to the house, which is very important. Um, we want these things to be good and strong. So I like metal roofing, and I like it to be white because I'm kind of particular about how things look. And uh, I like them to all be the same and, and to look good. These have a... Uh, there's a hook right here that um, we can take out and there's a cable that runs along here that then we took a piece of black poly tubing and so we can drag these units um, fairly easily across our pasture and uh, so um, we can drag these units along and we move them each day the reason we do that is we don't want the birds to destroy the grass um, underneath the unit um, with uh, scratching around and manure so i like to have this black uh this black plastic netting it's um heavy duty um deer fencing actually so it's a long lasting product i like this so much better than chicken wire chicken wire rots out and it's a passel to put in and not only that it's kind of spendy this stuff works really great it's um, not stuff that you can get at the garden center. You have to order it online, but it's um, three-quarter inch square deer fencing. Um, I can't remember the brand, but when I do a video on these, uh, building these, I'll post that. And we got a door here with a little latch that can allow the door to stay propped open there. We took a piece of metal rod and just bent it with a couple of eye bolts. We, I really like that because I like the door to be open and I leave them open because I have good predator fencing. Leave these open t uh, 24 hours a day. You could shut it at night, but um, if I have to shut in my birds to keep predators away, I'm 
kind of worried about that. Now there's always owls and that sort of thing, and so that's why I have the birds, that's why I have this door actually shut. And so we actually can open up, and we have another bar here at the base that hooks into to an eye bolt here. And that actually allows me to open up the door and, and leave it open. So if I need to get in there and, and work the birds, I, I can. Um, so let's go ahead and go in. These birds are going to wish that they went out instead of in. All right, so a little bit about the inside here. Um, nothing fancy. A um, couple of comments on our on roosts. I used to be pretty dead set against roosts. But um, what I was finding is when I had birds out on pasture, the damn things were wanting to roost so bad that they would roost along the doors here and that they would actually fly up and get on top of the house and there'd be, you know, who knows how many birds lined, lined up along the top of the, of the roosts and there wouldn't be any birds on the inside. And I really struggled, <coughs> excuse me, I really struggled with that because... I've had trouble with roosts causing some um, deformity of the breastbone on male hamps before growing out. And so what I did is I tried, uh, I tried a, uh, um, tried a, a wider, flatter roost. This is a one by three here that's on top of a, of a ripped two by four. And I'm gonna see how this works out because the birds like they like to per perch on roosts. Now they aren't too tall off the ground, they're just a couple of inches off the ground here as you can see. And so I'm not worried about birds hopping and jumping and beating themselves up getting to and fro the roosts, but um, I am watching these males growing out carefully to make sure that they aren't dam getting breast blisters or damaging their breastbone growing out while it's soft and malleable. So, um, I put these roosts in, but they're they're put in here to where we could just take them out right away if we if we needed to. The other thing I mentioned was I that we have a feeder in here, and this feeder is just a piece of PVC pipe, and um, it has feed in it. And I really like these feeders because they prevent the birds from slopping feed all over. And what we do is we adjust the height to the feeder up as the birds grow. And uh, that is a, that's a, a real handy thing to prevent food waste. Um, the other thing that we have here at this that I really like is we use a clear polycarbonate back plastic here. And light is something that you need to have plenty of in your poultry houses because they um, are... Uh, Light sanitizes the ground for us to keep disease at bay. And so these, um, these houses I orient on a north-south um, direction, a north-south direction, and that allows, um, you can just see there's a little bit of light going in there, but midday the light will be straight behind me here and it can shine into the entire house. And that's why you want the south side of the house to be completely opened up. But I also have it on the north side of the house because it allows sunlight to come in and that's really important to keep, uh, keep our diseases down. Light sanitizes everything. Um, the other thing is that you want to have um, good ventilation in your house but not have it be drafty and so how do you achieve that? Well you achieve that by having only one, in, one, one side of your house be open and the other side's all closed. What that allows is that doesn't allow air to pass through, to blow through the house, but yet it allows good air exchange here. Um, another little trick here, and I'm not sure if it'll show it well because of the lighting, but um, here you can kind of see it. The top of the house is open all the way across, so the metal doesn't close and make an airtight seal. That allows heat to rise up if, if need be. Now in the winter time, um, I can take some clear plastic and staple it onto uh, some parts of the house and kind of close it up a little bit tighter. And uh, that, works, that works pretty well for me there. So um, anyway, that's, uh, that's how I grow out birds on, uh, on pasture here.
of the things I wanted to cover in a little more detail about um, rearing out birds is the importance of feeding and watering. Um, I already talked about the importance of having feed available, in my opinion, to birds at all times. Uh, at least with hamps, under my system, that's what I do and it works for me. Um, let's talk a little bit in some detail. This is a black plastic tub. It's too bad the birds already got out here and ate. My stockman was already here today. I fill this each day with our with wet mash and the birds the birds eat it down. We take it in and scrub it out, fill it again. Just scrub it with a, uh, a stiff bristled brush. Uh, don't worry about bleach sanitizing or anything like that because it's out in the sun all day. I like to feed a wet mash um, and give that to the birds at least uh, um, once per day and we make our wet mash using whole milk uh, real milk from our dairy cows that we have here and um, I like to use milk as a wet mash I don't know about using um, homogenized milk or anything like that I have a couple of fellow breeders who have had mixed results with that um, but I have used powdered milk uh, calf replacer formula uh, that you can buy at the feed store, freeze-dried milk before, and that did work well for me. And it's also more economical than buying milk from the uh, from the store. So let's go ahead and come on in and uh, look at how we do the watering here. <laughs> so how I do watering is I maintain, this is kind of a little bit oaky, but works for me. Um, I maintain a, a reservoir right here. Um, this is a 13 gallon plastic tub. It has a vent on the top that's always important so that it drains out easy. And then <clears throat> this uh, line coming up here is, is an automatic float valve that always, uh, always keeps the reservoir filled. That's I think really important. I like watering to, you know, hauling water you know, that's like so a thousand years ago. We don't need to be doing that. I like things to be automatic. Uh, so we have a pipe that comes up. It's PVC pipe that I've painted black because I don't like to look at white pipe running all over. So that fills the reservoir here on top and uh, keeps it filled. There's a float valve in there and the, and, the, and the water. And then it flows out the side here, comes down. Of course, we got an isolation valve if we need to. And then it flows down. There's my bottom electric wire. That, <clears throat> that's the inside wire. It keeps the birds from scraping and digging holes along the fence. That's a real awful thing when that happens. So keep an inside hot wire. You can see it running down below the water here. That keeps your birds from scraping up against the fence. Otherwise, they'll dig holes under the fence to dust themselves, and you'll have birds getting out. So that's a little trick I do. And uh, they're smart. They don't mess around with the electric wire. So we have, a, we have an extension here, the PVC, and then these are the water nipples that I use. You can buy them on eBay. They might be available from other places. I really like these. Obviously, they're only good in the summertime, or excuse me, when there's not freezing weather. But uh, um, I, these are called horizontal, horizontal waters. What I like about them is that they generally don't create a wet spot underneath them. Uh, that's what I don't like about the vertical waters, and they're a little easier to use too. So the birds come up, tap them, and they just drink the water out of that little catch pan right underneath there. I have, for each um, area, I have five, five waters. It's probably more than I need, but um, it's what we put in. Um, I am somebody who believes in overkill, so uh, why not? We got five waters. And the same, the same reservoir there fills the entire length of tubing and keeps it all, goes all the way down there. Um, you got to be careful about putting these things on pressure, so that's how we do it. So let's talk a bit about feed. So of course we see the birds out here on pasture and uh, they're all eager. They're scratching around doing their thing. But don't be fooled, don't think that your birds can get anywhere near the amount of nutrition that they need, even on a pasture that um, is as green and lush as this one, because they just simply don't get enough nutrients. In fact, you can see them coming up for a treat here. Uh, that's another way you can that I always make sure I tame my birds down by every time they see me, they get some feed, 
because uh, that teaches them to come to me. I hate chasing birds around. So anyhow, tames them down and that's what helps. But green pasture can't even give you near the amount of feed. So we, I have feed available to the birds at all time. And let's go in here and take a peek. Again, we have our feeder here. They don't normally jump up on it, but I'm coming in here and they're all spooked. But uh, this is our my PVC feeder. It's two, two uh, um, light end caps with six inch uh, PVC which we just cut out with a uh, with a jigsaw um, you can do it any number of ways but the thing i like about this i'll try to get some of the shape here of course uh, you know how it is with the video there's always a little bit of garbage whenever you want to show a video of anything so we put our feed pellets in here um, i have my feed custom made for my birds at a at a local mill um, but you can kind of see here that the pvc sweeps back and that the birds make a mess by getting in. If they can pull the feed straight out, they will. But this this feeder, um, there's a sweep here. And so the birds actually, you'd think, oh man, they're going to waste feed. That's such a big opening. Well, they don't. It's all about the shape of the feeder. And I've bought any number of hundreds of dollars worth of different feeders and tried different things and looked on the web and gotten all kinds of harebrained ideas. And an old trough feeder like this one... Um, there's a reason that these type of trough type has been around for a long time. It's because they work. And if you look down on the ground here, you don't see any feed waste laying underneath this feeder. That's because those birds aren't kicking it out. And how many feet, different types of feeders have you tried on your own place and you look underneath them and there's just nothing but, but feed. And that's just wasted money and wasted energy. So um, we have these, these feeders here, and as I mentioned, we just put a single screw to hold it down, and then we'll start moving it up, uh, start moving it up uh, in height, because you don't want the birds to be able to really get in there and scrape it out good. You want them to kind of have to reach over and, and peck at it. And um, we've had really good luck with these feeders. They're really easy to make. You can make them yourself, so you can make a lot of them. You can make them in any length you want and uh, they're fast and cheap. Let's and that's talk kinda... a little bit about these uh, s uh, smaller size pins. Just gonna talk about them quickly. They're, they're actually empty right now um, because I don't have, all my birds are either in bachelor pins um, for my breeder males or uh, they're with uh, um, growing out on the pasture or my, my breeder hens, they have access way up there to five acres of dairy pasture. A dairy cow pasture so these are the uh, these are the units I use for grown out birds they're a three by eight foot and the reason I do that is that that is a economical uh, the most economical way to buy one piece of sheet metal to go over the roof and it still have some overhang and it's also the most economical way to purchase this um, uh, livestock panel this is four by four inch livestock panel I really like this because they there are times when I will put these outside of my perimeter fence and um, so I need the pin itself to protect from predators um, so this livestock panel keeps uh, most predator size predators out that are the size I need to worry about but it doesn't keep chicks in so again we have that black plastic here and then I do have chicken wire on the bottom of these to try to protect from say possums and that sort of thing that might try to get into these here um, there's a number of doors on these units the tops open up here like so and that allows for really easy access to the inside there's two compartments on the inside of these um, first one here is a, I guess you might say kind of the run and then further in here this is sort of the ins uh, the the coop if you will divided by a plywood wall with a hole hole cut in it and this is the area where the birds sleep I don't provide them roosts in these units um, uh, because I was trying to get them to sleep on the ground but the younger birds they they do fine they like to kind of huddle together anyway to keep warm and I'm brooding in February and March and the temperatures here are pretty low you know it can get down into the teens here so I need to make sure that the birds have quite a bit of feathers when I take them out of the brooding room, which was in a previous video. 
and they like to kind of huddle together. The other thing I have is this is a porcelain reptile heater here. Um, I really like these units. They add a little bit of, they add radiant heat to the unit. And I've read all sorts of pages of debate about whether you should provide heat to your birds or not. I do, and it works for me. And I think everybody who talks about um, adding heat as a mistake is dead wrong. I think you need to add heat, but you need to be careful about the type of heat you add. Forced air heat out of a heater that blows hot air around in your place is very different than radiant heat. And so before you start preaching about heat and humidity and all that kind of stuff, I think you need to understand your physics. Radiant heat is heat that is collected um, by the th th objects that are around it. It's absorbed in a different way than forced air heat. And I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to start a debate. The other thing about these units is you can see here that we still have the uh, plastic polycarbonate. That's really important. And we have this on the windward side of the, of the unit. The units are all tied together by extension cords, so they go from one to the other. They're tied together here. There's some of my a breeding project I'm on, black, black midget turkeys. Of course, they come over to take a peek at, at what's going on. They look at everything. So I raise midget white turkeys, and I'm working on getting a midget black turkey, and kind of, kind of fun. Anyhow, so inside here, I have a, I have four, a four prong outlet. I put a light timer in here that that's, uh, has a light connected to it that runs. I'll see if we have one here in another unit. And uh, so I provide my my birds with light and with heat. I think that's important. So again, we use the we use the PVC um, feed trough, and right here, this is a piece of PVC that um, down at the bottom there would be one of those red nipples that we were looking at earlier for water. And so when I want to water these birds, I just lift the lid up and I put the water in here at the hose, shut the lid and it's done. And when I want to clean it out, that just unscrews at the bottom and it can flush out. But they really don't need to be cleaned that often. They stay, they stay pretty clean. So I've got uh, quite a number of these units here. I have 20, 21 of these units that I use for breeder pins and uh, for grow out pins for birds until they are old enough to go out onto the pasture and i'll show you how i determine when they're when they're old enough to go out on pasture and it's not too scientific but it's very practical i put my birds out on the grass when they are you can see that this netting starts out with large squares and it gets progressively smaller when the birds are are big enough that they can't easily pass through the netting, um, even when it's electrified, if they're small enough, they can hop through there before it gets nips them. Um, that's when we kick them out here on on pasture, and uh, so that's a little bit about how I do the brooding. Um, deal with the younger birds before they go out on pasture. Can build up a lot of them here, and I really uh, I really like that. I also feed the younger birds uh, wet mash, and uh, you can see here, uh, this is a little bit dirty here with uh, old pellets. We can fill the wet mash, and then I just have a piece of plywood that's cut into a square there, and we can set that, uh, we can set those tubs down in each unit and, uh, and have wet mash. Wet mash is really critical, in my opinion, to birds, especially if they aren't out on pasture. I think that they need to have wet mash. They just digest and do better on mash and uh, if it's wet. So I just take our pellets and wet them down and that's what I do here. So that's the younger bird. I want to talk a bit um, about how I run um, adult birds that are, are mature. Um, so again, we have our individual, we have our individual, four individual corrals or pasture areas out there where I raise my birds. I separate them again by sex and age out there. Um, I do, I like to do not a huge number of matings. So, or excuse me, a huge number of hatches. So I try to hatch with each group that I have two hatches. And if there's a hatch that doesn't do well, I still only hatch two hatches because I only want to have 
um, two age groups of birds that I raise out. Um, last year I raised out eight different age groups of birds and it was a nightmare. To manage birds that are, that are months and months apart is really, really difficult. Um, it makes culling pert near impossible and it's just not something I want to do. It's very difficult to cull birds that are um, four months older than the rest um, and compare them. You just simply can't do it. And so what I do is I cull within each age group. I cull all those birds together and, and, um, and so I only have two age groups. So I have a group of birds that was hatched during the month of February and I have a group of birds that was hatched um, at the late part of March and the early part of April and those two groups and that's it. And then I toe punch as I mentioned in my other video to keep track of the individual groups. So here's uh, one of my midget white turkeys along with uh, my midget black uh, turkey project here. Um, let's talk a little bit about utilization of pasture and about how we deal with these older birds. So here's a couple of, uh, couple of older birds out here, older New Hamp hens. I keep all of my breeder birds, my breeder hens, if they were good enough to go in the breeding pen for a season, and again, I usually only breed from, um, from any given year up to four hens and usually two. So um, I don't have a whole massive flock of breeder hens flying uh, that I have to uh, watch out for. But um, what I do is I keep all of those down in that lower chicken house there. They all live together along with my turkeys that are growing out that you can see here. And they have access to the top pasture and also to the parts of this pasture here that aren't being utilized by the, um, by the grow out birds. And I just keep them together. And um, I don't have any trouble at all with keeping my chickens and my turkeys um, together. Um, here's a different model of feeder that I just usually have just wheat in and so that cap comes off and we can fill that whole big six inch pipe with wheat. The birds dip their heads in there and they, um, they, they eat wheat. Um, and then there's a barrel feeder down in there that's a custom jobby of mine that uh, I feed uh, pelleted feed out of. But um, I don't have any trouble with uh, keeping turkeys and, and chickens together. They do fine here with me, but uh, I practice, some would call it militantly strict biosecurity. And so I don't have a blackhead or try to keep all those sorts of diseases that affect turkeys negatively off my place um, by carefully managing biosecurity, which means no tours out here, means poultry friends that come and visit have to sh you know roll their eyes and dip their hand dip their feet in um, sanitizing solution and scrub their shoes and if you wear rubber loafers out here you get to wear a pair of extra uh, muck boots that I keep out here and that's something I'd suggest for all poultry keepers that are serious is keep a uh, keep a bunch of pairs of some cheap rubber boots around so that you can uh, have people who forget to bring them out and are wearing tennis shoes that can't be sanitized have those available for them.